Let us welcome to the stage SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. So I have to start with my disclaimer. So I'm going to give that to you. I'm going to give you two disclaimers. One, I'm from the SEC and I don't have a subpoena. All right, two. Um, I am from the SEC, which means that I have to tell you that the views that I represent are my own views and not necessarily those of the commission or my fellow commissioners. I am, though, interested in what my colleagues have to say, which is why when Chair Gensler started referring to the cryptoverse as the Wild West, I got interested. He's, of course, not alone in making this analogy. Um, it is a place, the Wild West is a place we imagine to have been lawless, a society in which the gunslinger with the best reflexes and worst morals wins at everyone else's expense. Merriam-Webster defines the Wild West as the Western US in its frontier period characterized by roughness and lawlessness. Bringing government into that kind of an environment seems like a no-brainer. But today, I want to offer you a little bit of a different take on the Wild West. And with that picture in mind, I want to give you some thoughts on a way forward in crypto regulation. The West of the past called the people who were chafing against the staid and staled societies of the East and looking to throw themselves into building a new future in a more promising place. The Western frontier was a place for the adventurous, the rough around the edges, the idealist, the free thinkers, and the restless. So I'm from Ohio, and Ohio actually was once the West. Um, and it was a place where people from the East went when they wanted to build a new society. Um, in fact, the part of the state that, that I'm from is called the Western Reserve. Um, I went to a university called Case Western Reserve University, and people ask me all the time, oh, you went to a military academy. And I say, no, it's named after the Western Reserve, which was actually the Western Reserve of Connecticut. But I know that probably those of you here, when you think of the West, you're not thinking of Ohio. You're probably thinking of somewhere like Texas. Um, but here, too, the Wild West was marked by more order than the movies that we, that we watch would have us believe and the stories that people tell. So I want to... Um, give you a little bit of an insight into that from Andrew Morris, who actually was a professor at Case Western Reserve University, but he did what a lot of other people in history have done. He moved west, he moved here to Texas, and one of the things he did is he researched the Wild West and identified numerous forms of effective private regulation. Um, he explained, for example, that Texas cattlemen, whose ranches were delineated by clear property lines, which was really important, were able to create order on their ranches. One ranch, he, he looked at the code of that ranch, for example, quote, prohibited cowboys from gambling, carrying six shooters, keeping private horses, running game with the ranch horse, horses, drinking, and stealing cattle from other ranches. Um, so th this was one example, but there were also, it wasn't just ranchers imposing order on their own ranches. There were an array of private organizations that were dedicated to maintaining order. These accounts don't paint a picture of perfect order. Of course, there are bad things happening in the West, but they do suggest that societal order does not always come from the public sector. Unfortunately, history would not allow us to see how these private arrangements really fully came into being and evolved with challenges over time, because as Morris further notes, quote, once there was wealth in the West, government's arrival was inevitable. Perhaps then it's inevitable on the crypto frontier as well. So let's turn our, our attention to the crypto frontier. Like the Wild West, it appears pretty wild at first. It's home to lots of shadowy code slingers, speculators, and some hucksters. This new West also has its inter and intra protocol fights, friendships for through shared difficulties and successes, colorful personalities, passions, dreams, hardships spectacular failures, and remarkable victories. But as in the West of the past, there's order and discipline in all of that rough and tumble. 
Because crypto is built on code, the code itself serves as a governor of conduct. But crypto is built on people too. And these people hold each other accountable, not only through unbridled public discourse, but through using or not using a protocol. Protocol users, competitors, bug bounty hunters, and sophisticated skeptics monitor protocols for hints of centralization, administra administrator keys vulnerable to compromise, slow network speed, high cost, lack security, and so forth. A system outage, rug pull, insider trading incident, or exposed flaw in the code gives rise to an inevitable firestorm. Decentralized communities collectively figure out how to deal with unanticipated problems. These cooperative and competitive, competitive disciplining mechanisms have helped to clean up the crypto frontier, though of course there's still a lot more work to be done. But the persistence both of this self-regulation and what I hear all the time is calls for clarity in government regulation from the crypto community suggests to me that lawlessness is not the prevailing culture of the crypto frontier. On the other hand, ironically, our gunslinging ways in the old supposedly state government regulatory world back east are causing people to question our commitment to the rule of law. Let me explain by raising several questions about our regulatory approach to date. I'll conclude by suggesting that it's not too late for government regulators to change course, set clear rules, and set rules that respect the unique attributes and challenges of life on the crypto frontier. So first question is, does the SEC really believe that there's legal clarity around digital assets? This is a fundamental area of conflict between the SEC and the public. Um, the safe harbor that I propose for token distribution events acknowledges that there is uncertainty about when crypto asset offerings implicate the securities laws. But the prevailing attitude at the SEC is that there is clarity. So why bother with a safe harbor? The idea is that there's clarity as to when crypto assets are securities. That idea must come as a surprise to lawyers who have been advising crypto projects for years and have struggled with this issue for years. Take the public feedback we received relating to the commission's statement regarding the custody of digital asset securities by broker dealers, which distinguishes between digital asset securities and non-security digital assets, um, the latter of which we will not permit to be custodied by special purpose broker dealers. In response, many commenters wrote in and said, whoa, we need clarity on when something is a digital asset security and not a digital asset security because you told us that we can't hold both, so you better help us think through what is what. But if we are taking the position that all tokens are deemed to be securities, then I guess maybe we don't need the special purpose broker dealer at all. So the second question is, are we enforcing rules by settling or are we just settling for ambiguity? The SEC, of course, in its enforcement actions points to Supreme Court precedent. We also are now pointing to our own um, growing list of enforcement actions. And we say, look, the case is closed. Most digital assets are securities. Let's just move on. So even if we were to accept that enforcement is a good way to set law and to set clear lines, we have to remember that most of the instances of enforcement actions that the SEC has brought in this space have been brought through settlements. There have been a couple litigated actions. Um, even in those instances, though, a determination that a token was offered initially as a security doesn't say anything about the token itself being a security at the time of the initial sale or the secondary transaction. So there's still questions there. But most of our enforcement actions, as I said, have been in the settled context. And when a, when a party settles in an SEC enforcement action, it's just trying to get done with that enforcement action. It wants to move on. It doesn't have an incentive to get the SEC to clearly spell out why it is it's deeming something to be a security, to set out that legal analysis. And in cases when a platform is involved, so that's where there are many potentially many digital assets involved, the SEC only has to say, hey, at least one of those things was a security, um, but they don't have to specify which ones or why. Um, so the ambig ambiguity actually ultimately serves us as regulators well because it effectively forces any actor with any connection to digital assets 
into our regulatory jurisdiction. Which leads to my next question. Are we fighting for investors or are we fighting for jurisdiction? So one, one area where this, I think, is, is at play right now is the stablecoin area. Um, there's a lot of jockeying for position around stablecoins. They've obviously grown really quickly. Um, they're used a lot. Um, and so the questions are coming up. Should stablecoin issuers be registered as banks? Should stablecoins be designated as systemically important by the Financial Stability Oversight Council? Are stablecoins money market funds? Should the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau step in to protect consumers? Um, it is natural that people are asking these questions about consumer protection, about financial stability, transparency, and so forth. But I urge that as regulators look at, at those potential problems, they also think about some other things. So here are a few things. First, they need to remember that many people actually find stable points to be really useful. Um, and so whatever we do to regulate them needs to take into account that if it prevents people or makes it harder for people to use stable coins, that's, that's a cost that we have to take into account. Second, regulators need to be really careful. Stable coins, again, like many things in crypto, you can use a broad term, but you have to look at the facts and circumstances. Stable coins are very different in transparency and what their reserves are and how they operate. Um, third, overly broad application of the law to capture stable coins inadvertently might capture other products and services. Fourth, attempts to dismiss stable coins by drawing on the experience with 19th century private banknotes are based on a misunderstanding of both. And fifth, stable coin fear is unwarranted. And, and I thought that um, Federal Reserve Vice Chair Randall Quarles gave a really thoughtful speech on this a while back, I think, or in this, over the summer. He said, we don't need to fear stable coins. The Federal Reserve traditionally supported responsible private sector innovation. Consistent with this tradition, I believe that we must take strong account of the potential benefits of stable coins, including the possibility that a US dollar stable coin might support the role of the dollar in the global economy. All right, so shifting from stable coins, um, Another question that I think we need to ask is, are we protecting investors or, or are we denying investors opportunity? Embedded within the negative Wild West analogy for the crypto frontier is a concern that unwitting and unwilling and innocent investors are being harmed by participating in the crypto markets. To those who don't view the opportunity to be part of those markets as valuable, the lack of regulatory clarity in, in the U.S. could actually be a way of protecting investors. Um, if ambiguity means that people don't want to do things here in the United States, that they want to keep Americans out of their projects, then hey, that could actually be a good thing because we're protecting investors. Um, and so we see, for example, widespread geo-blocking of Americans. That should concern us as American regulators. Uh, consider, for example, there have been some recently publicized example, examples of airdrops where Americans have been excluded um, from, from those. So again, we need to be asking, yes, investor protection is important, but part of protecting investors is also making sure that they have opportunities that they want to have. A fifth question, are we pretending that everything is centralized so we can regulate it? Chair Gensler pointed, has pointed out correctly that Labeling something decentralized does not necessarily make it so. We saw this phenomenon at play in a recent enforcement action purportedly related to DeFi, which interestingly charged a company and its two executives um, for running an illegal offering. So I was searching a bit to find the decentralized there. Um, and maybe it was at play to a lesser degree in a case from several years ago against the creator of a decentralized trading venue that had some centralized features. But what happens when we're dealing with a protocol that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer or person-to-code transactions without a centralized intermediary? Truly decentralized platforms do not mesh well with a regulated approach designed for centralized finance. As one commentator observed, so every time they say the platform must do this, the platform must do that, what does it actually mean? Implicitly, the only way of understanding these comments is as an interpretation of securities markets 
regulations as being about what kind of software is allowed to be written and this won't fly. As it turns out, though, lots of people really do want to deal with centralized intermediaries in the crypto space. So what I say is, yes, we can regulate those, but when we have actual, true decentralized finance, it should be treated differently. Sixth question is, are we catching bad actors or creating a catch-22? The good actors want to know which digital assets are securities. They want to know what the rules are so that they can comply with those rules. But during my four years, nearly four years at the commission, we've done little to explain what those rules should look like. I lay the blame on myself and on my colleagues on the commission. We simply haven't allowed the staff the room that they need to really sit down and think through the difficult issues around how, if these things are, or some of these things are securities, how that is going to look, how are these entities going to be able to comply with those regulations. Um, we need to, to do something other than simply drag people in through enforcement actions and force them to go through that process. We need to sit down and come up with a regulatory framework that makes a difference. So I know I've talked for a long time. I will say I've laid, I laid out in a dissent in the Poloniex um, enforcement action that we brought, I laid out some of the considerations we should be thinking about as we're trying to figure out how, if some of these things are securities, will um, the regulatory framework work? How can people enter the space? How can people operate in the space in a way that makes sense for them and for their, for their customers? Um, and, and so I'd like us to think through some of those things. And I think that really is the way forward for us at the commission level to give the message to the staff at the SEC it's time for you to start thinking about how a regulatory framework would work if we're going to have one. Um, so with, with that, I'll just say the goal is to spur a deeper cross-government commitment to searching for sensible regulatory solutions. The stakes are high because the government is riding into crypto town with the promise that it can do a better job than what's already going on there. And we, we do have regulatory experience that if we're called to bring it to bear, we can bring it to bear here, but we have to do it carefully. We should be taking our lead from Congress, we should be working collaboratively with our fellow regulators, and most importantly, we should be consulting with the public who will be subject to the rules. I might approach this whole endeavor with a much less strict hand um, than most of my fellow regulators would, but it really doesn't matter what I think or what my fellow regulators think, what matters I think this is really important is what you think, what the public thinks, what the people want. Regulators easily forget that, but our directives should be coming from the people up, not from the regulator down. And so um, I hope that we will really work on building a sensible regulatory framework. To paraphrase the standard closing words of a popular crypto podcast, which follow a warning about the riskiness of this space, you are headed west. This is the frontier, it's not for everyone. But thank you for allowing me to be part of your journey, West. Thanks.